Hello again. I thought I'd talk a little about one of the favourite health scares of the age, the so-called obesity time bomb. So worried about this are some people that in Britain an organisation called Action on Sugar are lobbying the government to have yoghurt cartons in pastel colours, which might look attractive to children, banned in case it leads to children ingesting too much sugar and so getting fat. I give a link to the relevant piece from the Action on Sugar website in the description to this video. Despite what is drummed into us relentlessly by the mass media, there's no sign in real life that there are more fat children than there were a few years ago. Why it should be that when we learn that today's children weigh more are taller than those 60 years ago, alarm bells should start ringing is a very curious question. It is this instinctive and negative reaction to any aspect of childhood which deviates from the perceived norm, meaning the way things were when senior politicians, judges and doctors were themselves children, which has triggered uh, the obesity crisis. The fear is expressed that if children get too fat then they might develop type 2 diabetes and end up going blind or having to have limbs amputated. Can we use the baby boomers childhood years as a benchmark and try to recreate the lifestyle then in order to reduce the seemingly unstoppable march of childhood obesity? Might it be worth trying to get children to walk to school, turn off the television and play outside more? as a means of saving them from the ill effects of their lifestyles. Life expectancy in Britain has been going up steadily for many years. So too has the height and weight of both children and adults. This is scarcely surprising. The main dietary problem in this country historically has not been overweight, but malnutrition. During the first half of the 20th century, the need was to build children up by providing them with nutritious, enriched and fattening food so that they wouldn't suffer from deficiency diseases such as rickets and scurvy. Children tended to be skinny and undersized and this led to all sorts of health problems. With the burgeoning prosperity in the 1950s and 60s, they began to put on weight which really should have been a cause for rejoicing rather than anxiety. As the baby boomers grew up, it became for the first time in British history rare to see a seriously underweight and malnourished child. The increase in weight of the baby boomer children went hand in hand with better health and rising life expectancy. The average child now weighed more in, than in the 1920s and this was recognised to be a good thing that would result, as a result, the children would live longer than their parents and their grandparents had done. The obesity scam that we see today has worked in several ways, one of which entails choosing a time in the past when people weighed a certain amount and then declaring that anything above that means a person is fat. One handy measure is to look back 60 years to the time that the average man weighed 10.2 stone as opposed to today's average of 13.2 stone. An increase in average weight of 3 stone? The inescapable conclusion must be that we are a nation of porkers. Why should we use 60 years ago as our baseline though? If we go back another 60 years, we find that the average weight of recruits to the British Army in 1900 was less than 9 stone. Perhaps this, rather than the late 1950s average weight, should be used as our standard when thinking about obesity. What is it which leads us to believe that 10.2 stone and not 8.7 stone should be the ideal weight upon which we should found all our hopes and expectations for the futures of the nation's children? Why should anything over this be regarded as dangerous? There are two reasons why Britain has fallen prey to a childhood obesity epidemic and neither have anything particularly to do with the health of the country's children. The first reason 
what we are reading a lot in newspapers about overweight children, is of course that following the trend for the last century or so, children in Britain now weigh more than they once did. That's been a constant process since 1900 or so. The clinical evidence that children are now unhealthily fat and likely to die at an earlier age than their older relatives is non-existent. The main cause of childhood obesity actually has nothing to do with diet and lifestyle and everything to do with a decision taken in the United States two years before the dawn of the new millennium. One of the easiest and most misleading ways of measuring obesity in a population is by working out the body mass index, the BMI, of individuals and arbitrarily deciding whether this exceeds a certain number and the person is therefore overweight. The BMI is found by dividing the weight in kilograms by the square of the height in metres of a person. This figure is then divided by the height again to yield a number which is typically between 20 and 35. The higher the number, the more likely the person is to be overweight or obese. This method, which is a notoriously crude way of measuring anything and doesn't alone yield anything much in the way of objective clinical data, shows once again the difficulty in comparing the situation with childhood now and the way it was in the 1950s or 1960s. It wasn't done in those days. We don't know the BMI of children in the 1950s or 1960s. Even if we did, it wouldn't be very helpful for the following reason. The basis for claiming there is an obesity crisis is that the definition of obesity is not a fixed one. It keeps changing and people keep deciding different things constitute obesity. Um, in 1997, for instance, one was officially overweight if the BMI was 27 or over. Then, acting on dubious evidence, American's National Institute for Health decided to lower the threshold from 27 to 25. On Wednesday, the 17th of June, 1998, the new guidelines were introduced. <coughs> and overnight, 25 million Americans became overweight or obese. In Britain too, millions of adults were officially reclassified as being too fat for their own good. I mean, it's not hard to show the absurdity of this new method of defining obesity. You've only got to look at professional athletes, such as um, the American baseball star, basketball star, I should say, Michael Jordan. When Jordan was at the peak of his career and a supremely fit player, his waist was just 30 inches. Nevertheless, his BMI ranged between 27 and 29, making him technically at least overweight and verging on obese. BMI makes no allowance for muscle to fat ratio or ethnicity. And that's led to the parents in Britain of slim, healthy school children being sent letters which warn that their child is in danger of becoming overweight. The other reason that we're seeing so many children being categorised as overweight or obese is so grotesque that I don't suppose that um, viewers are going to believe me when I explain how it works. A child is defined as being overweight if he weighs more than most other children of the same age and sex. And this is so obviously a strange way to go about the business. Let's try a brief thought experiment. Let's suppose that we we're able to travel back in time with all our charts and calculators to the medieval period and measure a large number of children's height and weight. Having calculated the average BMI for the group, we would then, using the current methodology, be obliged to define any child in the 91st centile, that is to say a child whose BMI was greater than 90% of the other children, as being clinically overweight. Never mind that this child is taken from a hungry or emaciated population, might look as skinny as a rake by modern standards. By using the methods we use today, he would be automatically defined as being overweight. 
what we have is a system which will automatically define a proportion of the children in any population, even those starving to death during a famine, as being clinically overweight or obese. I have to say a comparison of old school photographs of classes of children from the 1950s look very similar to more modern pictures. Both groups show average looking children, one or two of whom look a little larger than their classmates. There's really no reason at all to think that more British children are morbidly obese or even just a little tubby than was the case a few years ago. In fact, there's strong evidence to suggest the opposite. A government report called Health Survey for England 2003 was curious for the light which it shed upon the supposed obesity epidemic which was about to engulf the children, the nation's children at that time. It revealed that in 1995, the average weight of English boys under the age of 16 was five stone, one pound. In 2003, it had dropped slightly to five stone. The point to bear in mind, apart from this, is that even if some of the children in the class are slightly overweight by the standards we use today, that is to say having a body mass index between 25 and 30, this is actually associated with lower mortality rates and for people who are of normal weight. In other words, even if the nation's children were all found to be officially overweight, then their life expectancy <laughs> would actually go up rather than down. 